Buongiorno a tutti, diamo avvio a questa uh, nuova sessione. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the new session dealing with the nature of alternative currencies. The first uh, uh, presenter will be Nenad Fejic, who will be speaking about, we will be going back to Ragusa, and the topic uh, deals with the wool as an alternative currency. Please. Uh, in approaching the subject that the scientific committee has chosen for this 54th settimana, we would like to go briefly back in time for more than half a century and recall here the first two settimane of 1969 and 1970, dedicated for the first one to la lana come materia prima, i fenomeni della sua produzione e circolazione nei secoli XIII e XVII, and the second one to la produzione, commercio e consumo dei panni di lana nei secoli XII e XVIII. Since that time, eminent scholars, starting with some of the contributors to the first two settimane, have studied the lives and destinies of merchants who came to Dubrovnik from various Mediterranean countries and whose activities were closely linked to the wool trade and the production of woolen fabrics. Not to forget our distinguished colleague Paola Pinelli, who thanks to the research work made in the Datini archives of Prato, has removed more recently the last doubts about the presence of merchants and weavers from Prato and more widely from Tuscany in Dubrovnik in the 15th century. The subject we propose to discuss in this contribution is therefore part of a research field continuum. We want to focus on a specific aspect less often highlighted by scholars and which nevertheless underpinned the production related and commercial flows of wool in Dubrovnik. We would indeed like to discuss the partial replacement of real money, the silver grossi and money of account, the iperperi, by wool and woolen fabrics in the relationship between merchants and weavers in the first half of the 15th century. Facing the wealth of the archives of Dubrovnik, as well as the immense bibliography devoted to the history of the production and trade of wool and woolen fabrics, we had uh, to make a choice and approach the question of wool as an alternative currency from the point of view of merchants and weavers from the Iberian Peninsula, primarily the Catalans. The first question to ask ourselves is, was wool an alternative currency for all Iberian weavers and merchants active on the local market in the 15th century. The answer must be nuanced, as in the 15th century alone, more than 245 merchants from different cities of the Iberian Peninsula were active in Dubrovnik. The Catalans were by far the most numerous, contributing to the fact that in modern historiography, the incomers from the states and cities of the Iberian Peninsula were mostly identified as Catalans, but the recently but the reality was more complex in uh, Dubrovnik, where we identified in archival documents, in addition to Catalans, merchants coming from uh, merchants and craftsmen, whose origin was designated as from Barcelona, Tortosa, Mallorca, Valencia, Spain, Aragon, Tarragona, Perpignan, Navarra, Narbona, Cagliari, Portugal, Saragossa, Siracusa, and so on. Uh, and their use of an alternative currency varied considerably. The most important merchants who entrusted large quantities of wool from Barcelona and Tortosa to the care of their local agents in Dubrovnik and therefore made the most profit from the sale of this article on the local market very rarely traveled overseas themselves. They belong to the Barcelona Patriciate, who are sometimes members of the governing councils of the city or high-ranking officers of the Catalan Customs Service, such as the Giberts, the Roda, or members of Florentine families settled permanently in the Catalan capital, such as the Davanzati, the Aldobrandi, the Neroni. Uh, the presence of their names in governmental, notarial, and judicial registers in Dubrovnik is therefore more discreet than in the Catalan cities, being relegated to the background by the presence of their local agents in the Dalmatian city. From the point of view of these great merchants living in Catalan cities, wool was a commodity like any other, insured by local insurers and transported to the Adriatic ports by local, mainly Catalan ship owners. 
Both insurance and transport prices were expressed in local Catalan currency, whether real or of account. The silver coins, Croats, and gold coins, the Aragon florin, were mostly used as real money, as the currency of account, Solidi and Libre were used. Then there was a second category of medium-sized Catalan merchants who assumed a dual function, agents acting in Dubrovnik for their respective patrons in Barcelona, and at the same time local merchants who manage their own affairs. The members of this second category usually stay long in Dubrovnik and develop relations with foreigners and local people at many levels. Finally, there was a third category of people of Catalan origin, the craftsmen. These craftsmen were involved in different stages from raw wool treatment to producing finished fabrics. They were the least favored and most precarious category of Catalans in Dubrovnik, both economically and socially. In most cases, the local registers in Dubrovnik reveal neither the precise origins nor the exact circumstances of their arrival in the Dalmatian city. Having no capital, they could only rent their labor to their wealthier compatriots or the Ragusans. In the best of cases, after some attempts, they created small weaving, full, uh, fooling or carding workshops that were never safe from sudden reversals of fortune. It is precisely this third and most modest category of Catalans who, having no money of their own, has left the most numerous testimonies in local Ragusan sources on uh, using wool as an alternative currency. In the credit contracts, wool was used as the currency advanced by the creditor. The debtor, the weaver, had to process the wool and repay the credit in the form of fabrics in various stages of completion. His work as a weaver added value to the wool and the result of this work, the fabric, provided to the creditor also included an interest paid on top of the quantity of wool received. As we will see in this case, the wool had a value agreed upon between the creditor and the debtor. Still, the challenge for historians is that the monetary counterpart for wool credits was only sometimes included in the contracts and was tacitly admitted. In such cases, the wool was set up as an alternative currency reciprocally accepted by the creditor and the debtor. In the general absence of precise currency references for the credits in raw wool contracted by small weavers, we must try to establish the link between money and the cost of wool in Dubrovnik, and then transfer this relationship to the contracts where the amount of the credit was established exclusively, exclusively in the quantity of wool given by the creditor merchant to the debtor weaver. Any constant and regular relationship between the amount of wool advanced and the number or even the dimensions of the fabrics recovered by the creditor throughout the 15th century would make possible the evaluation of wool as a monetary instrument in Dubrovnik. This task is made even more difficult by the fact that the instruments of payment in Dubrovnik, as elsewhere at that time, were both real money in gold or silver and money of account. Without going into detail about the monetary system in Dubrovnik, it should be pointed out that in terms of real money in gold, the Venetian ducats were the most present in circulation, followed by Florentine florins. The real silver money was mostly represented by the Ragusan silver denari grossi, and to a lesser extent by silver coins minted in the neighboring, neighboring kingdoms of Serbia and Bosnia. The currency of account in Dubrovnik was the Ragusan hyperperus, knowing that the ratio of the silver grossi to the hyperperi was 12 grossi to one hyperperus, and that this ratio was unchanging, one can follow the rate of devaluation of the real currency, the silver grossi, against the, against the Venetian ducats, and consequently also the devaluation of the current money of account, the hyperperi, throughout the 15th century. It is therefore also possible to follow, and this is what interests us in particular, the changes in the price of wool as an alt alternative currency in Dubrovnik. Firstly, in the granting and refunding of credits between merchants and weavers. Secondly, in the summonses to pay when debts in wool were the cause of disputes between creditors and debtors before the civil court. And thirdly, in partnerships contracts related to the production of woolen fabrics in which the contributions in wool participated to the same degree as money in the profits and the losses of, of parties 
involved. As an alternative currency, wool was subject to devaluation resulting in inflation, which caused severe problems to creditors and debtors who used wool and woolen fabrics as instruments of credits and repayment. In many cases, this resulted in clauses opening the way for subsequent readjustments regarding the number of fabrics to be produced from a previously specified quantity, quantity of wool supply, supplied by the creditor to the debtor. To try to answer the first question about the price of wool in real money and account money, we refer to table one, to table one, yes, uh, which shows the variation in the price of wool in the Ragusan market. This table shows some examples of granting of credit in wool in Dubrovnik between 1431 and 34. The period of greatest activity in the sale of wool and woolen fabric production in the 15th century. When the credit was advanced in wool by the merchant to the weaver, it was expressed in the weight of the credited wool uh, in miliari, knowing that the miliarium corresponded to the weight of 1,000 libre and that the weight of a libra at Pontus Grossum corresponded in Dubrovnik to uh, 358 grams, the biliarium of wool was approximately equivalent to 358 kilograms of wool. The examples given correspond uh, respective, respectively to 300, 500 uh, kilograms and so on. And uh, uh, in the last two cases of the table, but uh, as we can see in the next column, the amount of the credit was expressed in different ways. For the first two examples, a fixed price in ducats for the miliarium of wool advanced. For the last three examples, the prices are expressed for the whole quantity of wool, respectively 110 ducats and unspecified price in ducats and the price of 1,000 ducats and 12 grossi advanced to the borrower. We can therefore say that the wool credit contract had recourse both to an amount in ducats per miliarium and to an amount for the total quantity of delivered wool. The amount to refund in the next column, which includes the amount of the credit in wool and the interest rate generated by the same credit, is expressed in terms of wool fabrics, the unit price of which was also, though not regularly, specified in the registers. The debtor was obliged to deliver to the creditor within a period, which was usually three months, a certain quantity of wool received and transformed by him into fabrics. These fabrics can be considered as the refund of the credit by the debtor with the rate of interest included, but not explicitly mentioned as it had been a loan in real or account money. Creditors were sometimes obliged to sue the debtor waivers in the Dubrovnik Civil Court. The register of sentences of the Civil Court, of which Table 2 is an example, uh, show for the period between uh, 1436 and 43 the names of the plaintiffs and defendants, the amounts to be repaid, and the notarial registers in which the debts were originally registered, as well as the respective dates of registration. As can be seen, the debts were expressed in real or account money and fabric. Given that wool and woolen fabric were used as an alternative currency by merchants engaged in trade in Dubrovnik during the 15th century, the question naturally arises as to the distribution of income between the three categories mentioned above, those of prominent merchants based in Catalonia and those of the medium and small merchants or simple weavers who lived in Dubrovnik. For the great merchants based in Barcelona or Tortosa, as have been observed from the outset, Wool was not an alternative currency, but rather an article of the trade like any other, the value of which was usually expressed in local Catalan currency. At this stage, therefore, the contracts drawn up in Catalonia mention only the quantity of wool insured and transported, as well as an insurance premiums and transport conditions. What inter interested these great merchants was the placement of their products on the markets of Dubrovnik. They willingly delegated, as we have uh, said, the precise terms of these placements to their local agents. Since the price expressed in Aragonese florins and Venetian ducats as gold currencies or in the Catalan Croats and the Raguzi Grossi as silver currencies could vary at both sides of the wool route, 
The use of currency of account could allow, as already said, for possible readjustments of the differences between the values of the respective real currencies. All at the starting point of the wool route in Catalonia, we find information in local sources on the quantities and prices of wool sent to the Adriatic Gulf. Although it is rather difficult to come to precise and exhaustive figures, let us recall some data. The Italian historian Mario del Treppo, basing this work on his register of the local insurer Bartolome Massons, calculated that between July 1428 and December 29, 360 tons of wool were transported from Tortosa to Genoa, Pisa, Dubrovnik, and Venice through this Barcelona insurer alone. Claude Carrère, who also based his work, uh, her work on the register of Bartholomew Massons, estimated that the quantity of wool sent to the ports of Venice and Dubrovnik alone was 119 tons. Focusing on Dubrovnik, we have fi fine-tuned this data using once more the registers of the same insurer and covering a slightly more extended period of four years between 1426 and 30 we could confirm that almost 140 tons of wool were sent to Dubrovnik. All these figures prove the importance of the Ragusan wool market. In Dubrovnik, once the wool had been inloaded and weighted and the Ragusan customs duties paid, it is placed in the hands of local Catalan agents who were responsible for selling it to their partners, the local Italian weavers. The question arises why wool is acquiring the status of an alternative currency precisely at that moment, instead of the traditional instruments of real money or money of account favored in the Catalan ports where wool was insured and loaded on ships. This question is even more relevant as the relations between established by these intermediary agents with their local partners in Dubrovnik have multiple natures. Whether it is a question of credit contracts in the form of the advance of raw wool or semi-finished fabrics granted to debtors or in the form of company contracts for various stages of wool processing or in the form of lawsuits brought before the Ragusan Civil Court for non-compliance with the content of the contract, everywhere wool and wool fabrics substitute to traditional payment instruments. How can this phenomenon be explained? To answer this question, we need to look at the nature of credit in Dubrovnik in the Middle Ages, and more specifically at the issue of credit trade involving Catalans in this Dalmatian city. To explain the nature of credit in the Dalmatian city, the great historian of Dubrovnik, Barisha Krekic, has suggested several lines of inquiry that are still relevant. The importance of credit in the local economy increased in line with the growth of Dubrovnik's economic in general particularly in the 14th and 15th centuries, with the participation of the Ragusans in the mining boom in the Balkan hinterland, in Serbia and Bosnia. The Venetians, who had reconquered Dalmatia in 1420, after losing it following the War of Kyrgya, had never succeeded in supplanting their Ragusan competitors in the Balkan hinterland. This is even truer for the Catalans, the Ragusans having kept in the Balkan hinterland a privileged position thanks to their knowledge of the environment and their cultural and linguistic affinities with the ruling elites of the Balkan states. But the role of the Catalans in the city's economy increased with the introduction and development of wool manufacturing at the beginning of 15th century. In this context of the credit boom, the installation of new wool processing workshops, whether carders, fullers, dyers, required significant local investments. The communal authorities encourage these activities by acting as intermediaries in the storage and resale of wool to individuals, by making weaving workshops available to craftsmen, by advancing credit to uh, manufacturers, and sometimes by undertaking to buy back their products. As uh, for the agents of the great merchants of the Catalan cities, Dubrovnik, they encouraged and accompanied the installation of the woolen factories, advancing to the weavers' quantities of wool to produce. Uh, despite this obvious dynamism of the uh, Dubrovnik wool industry, the instrument of credit underlying it was not primarily money, whether real or account, but rather the raw material itself. 
it would seem that the reason for the absence of real money in wool production is to be found paradoxically in the increased production of precious metals, especially silver in the Balkan uh, hinterland. Uh, so the, one of the historians of Dubrovnik, uh, Yuri Otadic, estimated that between 1427 and 32, 25 tons of uh, silver were exported annually uh, from the hinterland. The exporters handed part of the amount under obligation to the Ragusan mint, which, mint, uh, which minted the local silver coins. From the register of this mint, the historian Sima Cirkovic calculated that the export of these precious metals in the year 1422 alone uh, amounted to more than five tons. tons. Uh, at the same time, as the precious metals of Balkan origins were exported to the Mediterranean West, the products of Ragusan woolen factories were exported in large quantities to demanding market in the Balkans. Thus, Yuri Otadic estimated that the value of wool exports to the Balkan markets amounted to 250,000 ducats yearly, only between 1427 and 32. To conclude, the role of wool as an alternative currency in Dubrovnik was certainly a result of the favorable economic situation which coincided with the emergence of the wool industry in Dubrovnik on the one hand, and a strong increase in mining production in the Balkans on the other, both phenomena being characteristic of the first half of the 15th century. The flow of precious metals from the interior of the Balkans to the coastal towns and the subsequent enrichment of the royal and princely courts and urban centers in Serbia and Bosnia created a need for luxury goods which was perfectly satisfied by the wool production in Dubrovnik. As uh, Professor Krekic summarized very well in his contribution to the second Settimana in Prato, precisely, which we quote here in the text, si può dire che a Ragusa in generale fu il commercio a stimolare la produzione, e questo è vero per la produzione di, panna più di, di panni più di ogni altra. Did wool assume, in a sort of a mirror game, the same role as silver currency as an instrument of payment in the first half of the 15th century? This seems likely to us especially as the role of wool as an alternative currency in Dubrovnik change in line with the overall changes in the economic activity in the Balkans. The great demand for fabrics in the prosperous Balkan market in the first half of the 15th century was the main asset for wool as an alternative currency. When the reasons for enjoying this advantage disappeared, the role of wool as an alternative currency in Dubrovnik also disappeared. It should also be noted that the, at the same time as the inflow of precious, precious metals from the Balkans decreased, so did the inflow of Spanish wool, which had been the source of the prosperity of the woolen factories in Dubrovnik in the first half of the 15th century. Indeed, the era of the predominance of a powerful patrician families in Barcelona engaged in the export of wool came to an end with the outbreak of the civil war in Catalonia in the 60s and early 70s of the 15th century. The civil war caused a decline and then an almost complete half of the export of wool to the export of wool to the Adriatic region, re region and especially to Dubrovnik, and consequently caused a decline in wool manufacture in the Dalmatian city. Without a secure market in the Balkans, wool and woolen fabrics could not benefit from an advantage that ensured their status as an alternative currency. So, the traditional means, primarily real money and money of account, again, became the main instruments of the Ragusan economy, including the wool manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Navic, for this very interesting presentation showing the several roles played by wool in the market. In Ragusa, some exchange good or money commodity or money commodity. This kind of reflection is very interesting. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for reporting also the account money. The second presentation is Catherine Vernat and Lisa Caliste. 
Fonese di Conto. Industrie e strategie individuali. Ok, the second presentation, they will be speaking about this topic. Come si fa? Non si fa... Bon, vediamo. Allora, se il titolo di nostro... Bon, D'abord, bonjour. Je parlerai malheureusement pour vous en français. Euh, si le titre de notre communication avec euh, Lisa Calis présentant le terme de troc entre guillemets. Ok, my cooperation with Lisa Calis and this term is very useful and it uh, was uh, it, it is subject to a lot of exchanges, both goods and services, uh, allowing us uh, to understand the meanings. Uh, that we have seen in the last few days. Uh, there will be some space. We have industrial districts or clusters uh, which haven't been very much investigated. Uh, and this typical uh, at the end of the Middle Ages on the overall growth rate from the 15th century to 1550. This allows us to see the circulation of commodities uh, traded uh, with other objects or commodities or labor circulation uh, in a monetized economy open to international uh, trading uh, thanks uh, to the production of both iron and uh, fabrics uh, exported uh, at sea and uh, on the land. You see this area with very large, with these very large areas that were for cattle breeding. And as you see, they were open to Metinac and Besniac and beyond that, Macer. Vallespir, this is an Aragon district close to the fair. This district is organized for this activity. It is open downstream, Cavera, and especially coastal navigation up to Barcelona and Valencia. We have these districts. They are very interesting, providing uh, producing, uh, productive activities, uh, both farming and industrial activity. In order for communication to be simpler, And we will be focusing on uh, international products with an international outlet, uh, fabrics and iron and steel for Valsera. We see the documentation in 1430, but it was present in 49 in Marseille. And it is uh, circulating in the second part, half of the 15th century. And we can see some very simple elements we have. Uh, uh, crystallized laboratories, uh, scattered uh, throughout uh, villages. Uh, these might be very interesting, but is, what is more interesting is that uh, laboratories uh, are local or workshops, uh, workshops and with local uh, labor. This is in very, very important. Uh, you see that uh, We have the industrial activity combined with a very important farming activity. There is a very large difference between this district and the others. Another district, Vallespir, developing with two major industries, steel and iron and then fabrics. And we see uh, iron and steel because uh, uh, fabric, is, fabric industry shows these exchanges in uh, kind. This sector has a lot of, of workers. Uh, and in each workshop, uh, we see Saint-Delier. 
for iron and steel. What is interesting is that uh, uh, we have a foreign uh, labor force, uh, whether it is uh, Languedoc or Basque, and then later we have Italians or people from Genova, Genoese. This district shows some active circulation, which was proven by Curio, some monetary circulation, as well as thanks to producers and merchants for the circulating money. But in the case of payment in kind, the value of in-kind payment is expressed. Uh, as uh, for the pastoral environment, it is open uh, to the uh, marketing environment. Uh, and we have a very specific case. We can say that Bata existed for, for some period of time. Uh, these are the archives that we have found. These archives have been divided into two charts. Uh, Valle Spire and Lo Devoir, but what is crucial is that you see a large disproportion in the amount of archives. Uh, we have 76 uh, deeds for Valle Spire, 356 for Lo Devoir, 351, sorry. For the Le Devoir, we reached the end of the 15th century for archives for Valle Spire district. Uh, we had them uh, until 1550. I hope you can read that, but you see, I hope you can read. We have both credit and cash. We have debts, uh, debt as well. Both for Vallespir or not. And then we have, uh, for Lot de Voix, we have two other uh, sources. Uh, one which is particularly interesting, we have uh, ex this kind of exchange. Uh, it is the very same uh, practice. So uh, goods and uh, commodities are being exchanged with others. Uh, as our colleagues uh, said, uh, we see the formulation of the deed, which is not uh, specifying in this case, like in the case of buying and selling, uh, or in the case of debt uh, uh, acknowledgement, we can buy or reimburse. But what is being stated here is that the product will be traded. And the formula is butter. Therefore, we have a landed property. From this viewpoint, it is very, very active. This kind of exchange or trading is subject to some accumulation strategy. As you see, this is another deed, and I would like to recall your attention on that. We have these lease contracts of movable properties versus others. What about the products being traded? Which products are being traded? You see a first list of products, uh, focusing on the quality of these products and their value. So very quickly, to go quickly, we have iron used as a means of payment, uh, then mules, and then you see in Italy, we have this list. In the list, we have uh, fabrics, wool, and then there is a large uh, diversity coming from uh, the very uh, diversity of this uh, district. We have olive oil, we have cereal, some farming production, as well as uh, fabrics. Uh, and we have other products uh, or linen. We have a large diversity we don't find in other areas. Uh, then we would like to to show the presence of this uh, uh, landed property. These products uh, don't have the same uh, role in, a, in, a, in the exchange. There are products used to buy and products that are only 
purchased, bought, sorry, and then they are being purchased uh, in exchange for labor or, or objects, but they are hardly given as a payment. In the same way for olive oil, for cereals, uh, woolen cloth, uh, Wool is slightly different. It is being used both as a purchasing or payment good. Let's look at quality. The quality of traded goods. As we have said, this kind of exchange is crucial because, uh, of course, it was necessary to know the quality of products. Uh, to, uh, to see the value as an exchange good, uh, which can be specified in monetary terms. These products uh, are known by experts, uh, but it is not inst the institutional experts we mentioned, but rather people setting their market relations. Uh, there are traders, uh, we have a salesman, and then producers uh, exchanging or trading with their neighbors. Uh, and these, of, they do know, they did know the product because they. And then products coming from this district, some of them are marked, they are recognized, and they have some specific name, and we will be insisting on that. First of all, iron. Feta set is a kind of iron, one third of one third. It is heterogeneous. It can be delivered, for example, in exchange for fabrics or wool. What does it mean? It means that the same bar of iron can include iron or steel and other, because it is very important. And actually, from the market viewpoint, it allows those buying to have a large diversity, a wide range of iron and steel or iron products, more or less valid. I would like to insist on Burel fabrics. Burel, what does, does it mean for traders? someone wishing to buy a, a piece of fabric. Uh, it is very, very important. Uh, we have Burel fabrics. What does it mean? It means uh, that it can, this wool comes from Azak, and these Burel fabrics are, are made a combed, uh, on a combed and card uh, a wool. They are carded. We know that. Uh, dyed. This wool is mixed, but it is the same thing. It doesn't mean that the product is of full quality, not at all. It is mixed. It means that there are different kinds of wool. And in this case, we have a wider range of products. What about prices? In the case of a payment in a kind, uh, the prices of the product correspond to market prices because in these districts so there was a market price. Uh, and as uh, for the prices, we have seen that uh, we have seen iron, we have seen a dolev, uh, uh, fabrics being exported. Uh, uh, up until the 15th century, you see that the price of iron uh, we have uh, four prices for iron. How is it possible? Because we don't need to, to report the price of iron in this uh, exchange because the price is known uh, starting from, these, uh, from the 15th century. We see these uh, selling deeds uh, that I was mentioning uh, reporting the just price. Uh, it is written there is a just price. Uh, uh, showing that this is a uh, uh, market price uh, known by dealers, blacksmiths, etc. And not only do they use uh, this uh, price, but they also produce this price uh, thanks to their exchange. As uh, for iron, the price of iron, 
It is always lower than the average price, the average price of iron in gross. It is the lowest uh, pie uh, side, and then we had the last one. Uh, and the first uh, three prices, as you see, are some exchange, is some exchange. Uh, and then the last, uh, the last is uh, some exchange uh, with uh, uh, more important dealers. OK, let's see what happens for Dure Fabric. As you see, in uh, 35 and 38, uh, we see some more. We have this market. Uh, and as you see, we have uh, first, uh, we have uh, the downward trend of wholesale uh, market uh, with an impact uh, on the development of uh, fabric paid in kind. But as you see, we also have prices that are part, that are average prices. Uh, these prices are not uh, so low like the ones we have seen for iron and steel. What is interesting for Lot de Voix is that, uh, as we said before, there is uh, some market price. And for example, when you sell wool, uh, go into the laboratory or workshop showing that it is uh, the market price of that moment. The work or work as an ex as an alternative uh, uh, or as an alternative currency. We are not speaking about uh, wages. We have to see how labor would become uh, an alternative currency and which kind of labor and especially the value of labor, the value of labor. We don't have much. We don't have a, a, a much time to go into detail. We have bi biographies. We have uh, uh, papers. But we see what happens inside uh, this uh, uh, country, society, or place in the countryside. Okay, we see Valle Speed, for example. There are no deeds. For some of these deeds. As we said, we have uh, some of the contracts uh, may not written, they're just uh, oral or verbal. And this also happens in other markets in France. So you see that labor, when there is uh, this exchange in kind, it is devaluated. There is an account which is difficult, for example, they are thanking and they say I, we will be working for you for four months. As you see, it is not the same. Let's see what happens. We have more deeds in Lot de Voix. They were not working to settle uh, a debt, uh, but they would buy some landed property. And as we said previously, uh, weavers uh, and uh, the others, uh, they are part of this uh, kind of activity. There is uh, some barter. I have a fabric and I can get a commodity. So skilled, this skilled work, which is acknowledged. Therefore, it is a profession. It is not just uh, uh, anyone improvising. The other aspect of this uh, kind of work in exchange is working. The deeds uh, that I showed you at the beginning, uh, labor provides uh, lodging. And labor is offered in exchange for dwelling uh, and in exchange for a specific production that is part of the production chain uh, that is being uh, uh, run by those uh, leasing or living. Therefore, it is a skilled labor 
that will be used that will be used okay as for the use of butter this is a very interesting point this can be explained at two levels simplified and I won't go into details I want to tell you about proximity and the so-called uh, uh, trust uh, relationship first of all we have some proximity level exchanging what you have in exchange for what you want <laughs> to have uh, you know the person you know the quality and then we have uh, we have a dying in company buying a fabric, a dyed fabric, and then these fabrics are expensive. And so later, these are all proximity relations. But then there is another level that we have seen. And we insisted on that, butter and profit. Profit is not always present on, at the on the first level. Actually, we there are traders or dealers. Uh, we have seen that several times, uh, and going uh, and with advanced uh, selling for iron and for fabrics, uh, they can uh, supply their materials, their goods, uh, like cereals, and they can sell these products internationally. It is interesting to see that uh, they get hold of these products, uh, they pay for the cost, uh, we have a foreign migrants multiplying notarial deeds uh, for the counterpart. Uh, and and they need some guarantee for themselves. In this case, we have a wonderful documentation some the supply of products they are very important. Then there is another very important element to be found and you see that at the end, uh, diversity of subjects. Uh, sometimes we have monetized exchange exchanges, and then we have exchanges in in kind. Uh, for example, we have this uh, the rental of a home in exchange for labor. So we have different uh, strategies to be developed uh, in the very same context. Uh, in the very same uh, eco economic context that of exchanges uh, in uh, kind. Uh, this shows the use of such uh, exchange in an open economy. As we have said several times, there is an intermediate level, which is also very interesting uh, in villages and small towns. Uh, these uh, dealers or traders uh, try to go outside, but uh, these men uh, are always uh, assisting women as brokers. There is some hierarchy, there is some specificity. This allows us to understand these relations and international trade. And unluckily, we didn't manage to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for your very interesting presentation, which is one of the many interesting presentations we've been hearing these days on barter as well, on the continuous existence and use of barter in history as an alternative currency to coins, currency. This, uh, presentation is comparing two different manufacturing realities of worlds. And this comparison is very interesting. Once again, 
This has been shown as that Barca was totally integrated or housed within the market economy. We close this first part of our meeting with a contribution by Raquel Escuro, Pearl, Jewels and Pounds, the role of precious stones in the credit economy, guarantee and exchange in the Venice of the 16th century. First and foremost, I'd like to thank of you and also the scientific committee and the organizers and the audience and people who are watching or looking at us here as streaming on streaming. Well, here we go. I want you to get started now with some picture. We have the picture now because. That decorated hair with pearls. So that's the way women show up of the 16th century painters. And these were rich jewels, like the rich jewels of the Serenissima, covered with pearls when depicted as a woman to magnify opulence and some self representation and marketing strategy. We know that the Cinquecento Venice painting was closely associated with political strategies of self-representation in Venice. But those gems, those stones, are stressing once more the, the, the pre-existing documentations listed in the inventories, but also also shown in the total deeds where we see these gems as an exchange um, assets money like currencies as we are saying these days also the credit and financial choice is not to be associated with currency only cash or money of account but also have to bear in mind a different way to consider money money is not a unit referring to some coefficient but rather a value being attributed being substantiated according to the demand and the relationship between uh, demand and supply between the two contractants. So the strategies of exchange can include uh, widely used commodities. Uh, and what is defined as a barter is also playing a role of refined exchange. To this, we have to add the different values um, given to objects, just enshrining their functional role, communicative role, cultural role, but also the possibility of being, of being, of being put aside to be reconverted in other goods of money. Gems and jewels can meet this need of being multifunctional. With this intrinsic value, is it to transport, is it to store, and uh, very stable in their, in their estimate. So these are the perfect money-like assets uh, so to be used in, 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 in mercantile economy, like the big Venetian, Venetian hub, the use of gold, gems, and silvers as alternative currencies, which is the main focus of this presentation. And first, I'm going to speak about their avail availability in the dwellings and houses of the Venetians, with some inventories collected in the core documentations, the Serenissima core documentation does provide us with a general understanding of several social classes. And I will be using the documents, notorial deeds, where those objects are fully described, and also the way of using them is explicitly said. And then I will speak about the credit market, and I will be referring to the case study of the banki of the Jewish ghetto. Once again, to a rich and notorial deed documentation, giving us a general understanding of the situation. Let's switch now to the first part of this. Let's try and try to understand what, what is kept in the houses of the Venetians. 
As already said, since the use of gems and silver and gold made those objects a perfect alternative currencies, so gems, jewels, and diamonds and pearls are frequently mentioned in the notorial deeds and also in the houses of the Venetians. The survey by Isabella Cecchini on the inventories uh, studied by the judges according to the diary uh, rights has shown that this type of object was present even to different um, quantities. And on the other hand, so they were put aside these objects to be reused as a guarantee and the departure or pawn. I made some sampling on a group of 100 100, 100 inventories after after death, uh, not for diaries, but post-mortem in general. So I have a lot of male, uh, so males uh, between 16th and 17th century from the defondi of the judges and the chancery of Venice, chosen according to general criteria. One third for each social class, uh, party shade, citizens, and all the others, artisans and, and the people, the commoners. And what we see, we see the same trend. We see the spread of precious objects in many social classes, but I mean the poorest ones, with the prevalence of, of work, steel objects, and silver made objects. After some distortion, what strikes me, for my understanding, as to see as these goods can be used as money, as means of exchange. And there was a great variety of these objects in all the dwellings, in all the houses of the Venetians, from Patrichet to the poorest ones. An example, so the small treasure of Camp Carpenter, Jacopo Zuanelli, was one fillet of 79 small pearls, both at the time of the wedding, for a value of 20 ducats, a, a, a golden cha chain, sapphires, and ribbons, 53 ducats. It was the treasury. And the other objects found for Marietta Loreda, 700 ducats, a set of, of silver maize objects, and other golden objects. But these inventories were so for so well detailed, and usually we didn't we didn't see uh, objects or goods given as a pawn. It was just a debt. So maybe the objects will be much more because the objects given as pawn are not listed in these inventories. Apart from inventories confirming the spread of these objects, an additional step is given by the document, the documents, the notarial deeds. And this is shown the other uses, representing a sort of, um, showing the symbol of, of, of these objects, a symbol of money. So objects to be used, to be a pawn, so with the prospects of uh, giving these objects back. Different, however, is looking at these objects with the intent of using them as money-like assets in credit and financial operations. Not the same objects are always chosen for one use or another one. It's not taken for granted. And so the notorial deeds helping us to better understand the situation to understand what Venetians prefer to use when this was not a pawn, but when this was a matter of money-like asset. Silver objects are, are very eye-catching also to this extent metal, which could be remelted for a, a new coinage, was very well appreciated. It's quite similar for jewels we could be disassembled to recover the components. At those times, it was the intrinsic value which was very important for the exchange between the two contractants and the agreement between these two contractants and all the artistic aspects. Without speaking so long, with very detailed analyses, several tables of these in-progress work, 
seems to be interesting to me to give you a general understanding from an example which is very meaningful to me. I mean, types included in a deal at least 113 um, stones and gems for cover a depth on 1,200 ducats. So for um, by two, I mean, um, uh, jewelry, um, jewelry merchants vis-a-vis -vis this top of family. You see these objects are divided into several types. The full list will be provided also. And so you see there is everything in, and this is the division of rates for each stone. So disassemble and lose. What for these 113 pieces list? They were not in the bottega in the workshop, but already given as a pawn for a value of 3,000 ducats, not 2,200 ducats, as stated before. So the debt was much or was was much higher, and the Jewish already gives some rights to these goods to other uh, 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 brothers in case of no payment creditors must attack those goods to pay another kind of debt at other ghetto bankies. As you see in the objects, we have a wide type of objects, but we see the trend also from the rest of the survey and from notorial deeds of the trend of preferring the use of rings Above all, the rings with rubens, sapphires, diamonds, and pearls. And you see set with these jewels, with these gems. So loose stones might be a good investment, uh, as much as metal-made objects, and in form of contents of financing and credit are, to a large extent, uh, accompanied with stones and pearls above all. A rich example of use, alternative use of pearls is given by these detailed list of pearls that the Jewish Chervo living in Cervo made in 1634 to Pietro Marcello. A 48 pieces. We have a specified list after a long trip in the Indies. And in the content, there were a number weighted and described one by one, as you see in this example provided. This is an, an extra to this dog. These were genuine pearls. And from a viewpoint, it was just uh, the testimony of the, of the glass pearls made in Murano, which are contemplated in the descriptions of many workshop um, owners in Europe. So, so. So once we understood the way this is uh, working, I switched to a case study. So the skilled operators uh, work as the gates of Jewish, so as Jewish operators. So in the non monetary exchange, we have more or less favorable assessments. Gave us the uh, the possibility to see the discrepancy between uh, established value and the real value they will get at the second time. So a sort of, of agreement made it possible to produce a sort of hidden or additional value, certain formal modalities of alternative uh, properties made the barter a, a sort of refined practice of change, credit session, and financial management. Since the late Middle Ages, uh, we have the Jewish operators. They were users. Uh, this the way the keys of their activities since the Sedenissimo just constrained this minority to have these two traits. But Jews had seen the possibilities of this hidden exchange through Barter, and the consequence was a stronger, stronger tendency to be paid back in commodities, not in cash explicitly going against what established according to the agreements. In addition, we have to say more and more beneficial to us because the Serenissima since 1433 forbid it the, to, to, be, to be owners of real estate properties. 
So as soon as the Jewish activity became stronger, money like assets made it possible to introduce new forms of credit in the market of used commodities, not in banki, but also in strazzeria. Without the asset as a pearl, we substituted these to a sale with a deferred payment with installments over three and eight years. So the session of the object was just officially a sale, which was a simulated, a fake sale. And everything occurred to a passage of value direct um, hitting some interests. So the, the seller was sacrifi sacrificing a, an asset in order to get some liquidity of the other assets. So this hidden rate was, was quite high thanks to the multiplication for the time of the installment. So we got a bear, uh, an interest-bearing uh, rate, and the seller got the object to be introduced into the market in a very speculative way. Exchanging or giving to third parties uh, rights to the credit was enriching the speculative opportunities for the two parties involved. For this uh, refined way of trading jewels in, in the lagoon, we also have the, the beating heart of the Jewish community after the establishment of the Getin in 1516. A market like the one of the capital of the chief town was an ideal ground. And this practice will be described by me according to the relationship with female clients. And today, I will speak of jewels as pawns. Even though in Venice, we have a lot of, of, of evidence like a, a pawn shop. So the absence of this institute, a pawn shop, as an alternative to the Jewish credit, this gave, uh, uh, gave rise to these informal solutions, uh, supporting the use of alternative currencies in the Jewish marketplace. Also, the Republic was trying to, to, see, to ease uh, the resort to little valued goods with the maximum threshold for each operation, just a few ducats. And then the issue was imposing clauses within the maximum limit of exchanges per year for each individual banco. So this, uh, this made it possible to find alternative ways, forms, uh, for possible transitions and to uh, overcome this hindrance. Also, we had additional form of exchange. So credits pass over as objects, pearls, jewels, gems, as I said. There were something more useful along with the other categories, luxury categories. I open a parenthesis. This is a small case in the large luxury brand mark, a stick of pearl, jewels, diamonds, and so forth. But most, they were fabrics. Uh, I'm just getting, um, taking this out, but we have to say this. So also, there were fabrics. I'm not considering fabrics. I'm just considering gems and jewels. <coughs> Why gems? Why were gems better than, than fabrics? Because their value was the material value, not deteriorating like a, a, a woolen cloth or, I mean, a silk drape. So rat will not eat, will not eat them. And also we got certain uh, credits and also objects, Giulio Donati giving Banchieri a very good instrument for a credit in exchange of 60 pearls for 271 ducats, 2 lire and 18 sous. Oh, piccoli. So this figure was referring to an agreed upon exchange, two credits expressed in a monetary coefficient, but concretized in another form. So it was given the Jews to buy pearls to be used for additional deals with other merchants. As a consequence, the selling activity of pearls and gems to a bank and boutique it was not unusual because their capability of reselling was so great. This system was perfected so much. We have the rights of uh, on landed properties and also shares of the public debt. This guarantee was uh, solid. After its use within the Jewish group for private businesses, it's also for community businesses. 
for the economic management of the of the university's interests. Pair of diamonds, the silver, and so forth. So this type of uh, commodity had an equivalent equivalent value higher than the currency within the credit market and the Venetian financial market. In such a way, we had additional passages. I mentioned the case of the 48 oriental pearls. If we look at these much better, the session from uh, uh, Christian to Jews was not a simple say, but a sort of interest bearing rent. So the uh, Christian gave it to the Jews for a couple of years. This was capital and the gains expected. If it was normal as uh, bankers and stats at all uh, use objects and pounds to rent them and to get additional income, in case of pearls, the devoted Pietro Marcello, so this was giving the, the petition uh, money-like assets to be reused for the agreed upon period of time. So Jewish got a sort of indirect effect. When pearls uh, went lost, so the tail list, now you see the breaking down, all these pearls have been weighted very well. The list finally shows it was possible to precisely recover this. And also to say that in case of no, uh, in case of no reimbursement, the sum was not 450 ducats, but up to 600, with the penalty one third. So these were the gain expectations. And quickly now, reaching my conclusion, I switch to the last bit of my presentation, the last niche in my studies to the role of women clientele. Because women, not only they were the users of gems and jewels, of these objects, items, and not only adorning them was really rich. This was the habit. So the, the males of the family so gave these jewels to their uh, ladies, showing the grandeur of their families. And women, women also, they used jewels very much. They were in jewels a lot. What I'm telling, that's an example of 130 notorial deeds for the period of 1556, 1550, 1564, a quite limited uh, sample, just transactions on jewels and pearls. That's a niche vis-a-vis -vis the mass. Also, we have fabrics and other kinds of objects. Well, in this case, I was very much interested in telling you the, 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 the rate of women goes up to 17%, which is much more, which is the usual figure in transaction between majority and minority. So it's quite higher in this amount of, of, of people. In more in detail, if the session of objects for real or fake sale was uh, grinding on clothing and, and linen, once we look at women's clients, these types were, 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 were higher, but loose uh, gems uh, quantity goes up. These are objects easier to use. They knew these objects very well because they, 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 they were wearing these gems. But I want to stress that very often, almost always, that these gems uh, were just from the uh, diary of the, uh, I mean, um, um, immovable assets, or I mean, the family, uh, I mean, chattels. And uh, also, these jewels were kept when also they were widows. They prefer using jewels uh, versus the use of cash. So if they prefer to get uh, jewels instead of getting lands or whatever, because they could resell these jewels. And that's very interesting, because, as I said, different from the common law, the Venetian law protects much more women for for keeping these rights, for keeping these joyals. They are freer to act in person in order to preserve and to keep this property, property ownership rights. What about these objects? So in case of widows, first we had just the, 
whether to stop uh, the use of these jewels by their husbands. A case of a ribbon, a ribbon, a diamond, two hundred ducats, that in June 1557, the widow of Apollonio Massai was just a mean um, considering. So we have a lot of passages of credits around that purchase. This was just one of the next steps of different uh, uh, sales. Jacopo de Jeremia was a delegate for these, for these sales. A lot of clauses were considered from the veneration system of the ghetto. Widows, in addition to, to, to these chattels, so, and also widows had some troubles after their husbands passed away. So the amount was uh, three small rings, one ribbon, one suffice set in it. A husband bought from a Mildariano, a Jew. Also, Marietta was not capable, C couldn't just uh, um, sell. So this was the problem. So she decided to give the creditor a guarantee waiting for the uh, for the final balance and also she was giving the manzoni credit for a total amount which was the double then the real price of three rings equal to 150 ducats so the session of rings was not so uh, was not a barter but we got some credit operation including a full set of hidden interests and so the interest uh, was uh, as twice as much as uh, the uh, uh, money, or as the initial uh, money land. Also, the opponent's way, we, we decided to give the Jews one or more precious stones. And this might happen because they need to monetize it to recover cash. Also, using the, go the, the goods put aside. This is quite common in, in the, I mean, the lower class. Uh, women, just going back to what I said at the very beginning, these objects uh, are quite um, differentiated for quality and quantity, but in a broad range of definition populations, it may happen that someone of the popular group can resort to that. Caterina got 500 ducats from pearls and silver objects given to the most important ghetto uh, bankers. Especially uh, there was uh, an interest bearing a rate of 9%. And however, to stress, 9% is more advantageous than 6% usually applied on, on land property uh, borrows. When we had to use jewels and pearls, the advantage was to the different uh, social classes. And just one, one, one necklace of uh, pearl, with uh, of Gaspar Spinello to get the 700 ducats from the users. And then 400 ducats for a second necklace of pearls, a chain of pearl. So also we have to to, to consider also the possibility of investing in credit activities. Also as direct operators, also resorted to specialized operators with some different amount. Or to divide between banking and society to minimize the risk, exactly as man, as man did. So Banco uh, Bottega Reyes could be covered up with the session of one single object, like a string of pearls. One alternative. We might use the sale to acquire the sum of money or the rights. The, child, the, the Venetian law enabled them to do so once they were widows. So these, these women were so active in the alternative currency market diffused in Venice that they shortly have shown you. Thank you for listening. Grazie a Rachele per questa preziosa uh, comunicazione. Thank you very much. A very interesting presentation. Belli e baratti. Jewels, butter and a lot of credit and debit. 
Okay, we have a 20 minute break. Please fill in the form for your questions.
Bene, diamo avvio. We are about to start the debate. I, I would like to start from the questions for Professor Fejic. The first one, Elizabeth Camuzzi, please. papers in this panel. Um, and my question is about if you could speak a bit more about the types of people who are buying this wool and then paying back cloth, and if you ever see women who then will spin the wool, or at what, um, what stages in the process of wool being turned into cloth you think these people are involved. Marianne Kowaleski. Um, thank you for all the papers. Uh, my question involves what difference did the quality of the wool or of the fabric make in the exchange of payment, especially because Verna and Kalista pointed that out, that there were differences. I'm thinking here in, 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 I'm familiar with some of the procedures you're talking about in terms of English wool, which comes in vastly different qualities. And in fact, the Italian manuals, like Pegolati, mm -hmm. went to some trouble to distinguish the different prices. You know, John Monroe edited the wool schedules. And your description, you, you didn't go into any detail at all of the types of wool. Did that not make any difference? Was it uniformly the same type of Catalan wool that arrived in uh, every time so that it made no difference? And then similarly, when you're using cloth fabric as a means of payment, was it always the same kind of fabric so they didn't need to specify the quality which is why, or in fact, did the quality of the fabric influence the price that was assigned when, when textiles were being used um, as payment in kind? Laura Barnett. So thank you for the paper. I think, um, again, similarly to the English system, it felt similar to what we see at the putting out system. And therefore, I wondered, with those contracts you have, whether you had craftsmen paying for other goods in wool, or only when you were seeing the transactions between the wool factors and the craftsmen. Was the deliberate, and you mentioned the statute, which prevents them, deliberately tries to prevent craftsmen acquiring more wool than they can weave? Was that an attempt to prevent a kind of development of wool as a secondary commodity they could use for paying for other goods? If we are only seeing it within, between the craftsmen and the wool factors, so within, like, as a putting out system, was it because of um, a risk of fluctuation between wool and silver, which was, in effect, creating a risk share between those two people? Or was it because of a competition over those labor of those producers? If there's a limited number of craftsmen of, of providers of wool, that those who are bringing the raw wool in, the Catalan merchants, need to convert it into the wool for selling on into the Balkan market, and therefore they are, in effect, controlling the labor of those craftsmen by ensuring what they get back is that product they need. So a few questions there, thank you. Ciriacono. I want to ask Professor Fates one question, confirming one of my hypotheses, the relationship between Dubrovnik and Venice, and the problem of a wool-making factory, a wool meal between Florence and Venezia. Florence in the Quattrocento is more important than Venice for the wool-making activities, and then Venice will continue uh, to go in the second half of the Cinquecento, and Venice will be more important than Florence. We'll, 
will get important grounds. But I want to ask you as to the desired competition between Florence and Dubrovnik. Ben is as to important major assets. The first asset is money. So Ben is as the money, ducats, ducats. And the second asset in Venice is the development of rural industry. And so we have a, we have a ground, land, wool, meal, very important. So I want to ask you, do you accept this interpretation of my, of the as a mean and confirmation of, of the power of Venice versus Florence for wool making, or wool meals? Not just for barters or for selling wool, but rather two main pillars, milestones of industrial capitalism, i.e. quality and qual so currency and quality of wool. Well, uh, if you allow me uh, to speak French. If I can, I can speak French, if this uh, point. That's a a question of special interest because it seems to me there is a common point, a common ground. I'm, I'm going to answer the first question now. If I got you right, people taking part in trade exchange of wool, who were these people in Dubrovnik? And I have to confess, I didn't elaborate on this point in Dubrovnik and in Venice and in other towns of the Mediterranean. The rich citizens and petitions participated in wool trade. They were willing to participate in trade in wool trade. I cannot elaborate on this anymore now, but I, I have to tell you I, I know the name of these uh, of these players in Rag in Ragusa. We 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 got citizens and also petitions taking part in wool trade in Ragusa. For the question raised by Kavanensky, so I mean, once again, we can speak even more of the quality of wool. We have to speak of the wool quality. This was uh, the main, the main focus of this trade, the main object of this, uh, of target of this trade. I can tell you that in the sources we have no evidence of a big variety of wool. Ca Catalan wool is defined as. A Catalan wool, knowing that, and we have to make reference to to, to other ideas. This wool was not a high quality wool, Catalan wool versus English wool, which was of higher quality. And in contrast, the price was set, calculated. It, the, the price of the wool reels were in function of their dimensions, of the size of these reels. And this, this made the difference. But it's, we speak always of wool of the same quality. We have not, we do not have a huge variety of wools. If you look for some differences in a way, starting from Ragusa sources, you won't find any. Sorry. And, well, I'm, I, I didn't understand the third question. Once again, the, the question about the, 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 I mean, the players of this trade. And, and maybe that's a path to, to find. And the role, the role of of credit, the role of the credit in wool, and not in silver. So that 
that appliance, which seems to me that you have two circuits, one monetary circuit, taking into account or encompassing the big wool merchants who settled down in Ragusa, and then we have a local loop circuit focusing on or based on on credits in, in, in cash, in, in, in kind, not in cash, in kind. Credits in, 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 in kind. And I try to explain this through the interest of the Catalans to export to export silver from the Balkans towards the, the West. And not um, considering this in the interior uh, circle for wool making. They got interested to export silver and gold without uh, using it in the local production. That's what we can conclude now. I think that's a, a, a sort of pathfinder in a way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's switch now to the questions for Calista. Bernard. Grazie. Thank you for the presentation. I've got two questions to ask because you said you speak of two different realities, and I believe that um, as to the use of non-monetary means, this social background is also very important when we use, when we use non-monetary means for payment. I'm recalling uh, what happens in Brescia. We have the iron industry, so, so the dynamic. So we have uh, commodities. Commodities have a huge, a huge role to play. Woods belong to the community. The furnaces belong to communities. Iron is used also to pay taxes. So to pay taxes using iron, which is most affecting the dynamics of the place inside. Well, something else very important to me. You said labor work. The use of labor of work as alternative currency. OK, but even this time, I want to get more information. Is, can you specify, elaborate on the quality of work? Because in furnaces, masters being hyper, hyper skilled, super skilled, they just paid a lot. Whereas in the spinning industry, the selling industry it turns out to be slightly different. I would like to get more information on this point. Thank you. Natasha Kokiri. I have two questions to ask you. As for labor and quality, I'm trying to focus on quality because it seems that sources are very important. Therefore, we go back to one question each, uh, and also barter and profit, uh, proximity, negotiation. Confidence is very, very important. This term has been used, but it takes time. And the second one, uh, profit and barter. And if I understood properly, barter is seen as a flexibility instrument. Therefore, in the labor market, if the same entrepreneur can work on in the two, I mean, having a, a fixed wage to labor, I don't know the context very well. Or maybe 
from time to time. Arianna? has to do with the influence of transport, if there is any influence on the types of goods or prices of payments in kind, uh, the influence of transportation networks. And I'm thinking here of the paper on the first day, uh, because it was so obvious that, uh, as Thomas Affley said, that the topography of the mining region uh, influence the development of the Fenvert system. Uh, it was so isolated, but also the transportation took so long to get different places. So you mentioned specifically that I think it was uh, Vallespeer had access to coastal networks. You know, clearly the one area had iron, and so the landscape produced a raw material that it's not surprising it was used as payment in kind. But if you go beyond that, is there any way that we could measure or assess or speculate about um, access to uh, transportation networks, especially since iron is a heavier commodity, so coastal or river transport would really have facilitated its use as a payment in kind? Thank you for your questions. Well, I know, I do appreciate the works on everything which has been done already. I do appreciate all the works, different points, and the, the, the communal uh, properties, all these in investments. They do not exist. And later on, for, for furnaces, we have some technical features for furnaces. This was not the case. What's interesting instead is that finally we have some investments in working tools for workshops, quite expensive as the local economies. And these tools uh, uh, for traders and whatever. In, Catal in Catalonia, and along with these, we have a, a very skilled manpower. It's not uh, a manpower having skills, very, very uh, upskilled, taking into account all these activities uh, and switching from one part to the other, sometimes in the Netherlands, sometimes in Italy, for Italian, it's totally different. Uh, for the Basque countries, people being, being people just settling down, even though they have capitals, so some buildings and properties, and they come with some uh, little capitals in silver, two or three uh, rates in silver in their uh, uh, bags. And Italians come already with some additional, with some financial capabilities different in a way. However, independent from these people being a blacksmith or whatever, mean weavers or whatever, spinners, uh, and also mean uh, coal miners, uh, they all come from the same nation. At the very beginning, we have some uh, 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 mixture between the Basque countries and the, 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 the black people. So they're just fighting for, for having the best place to settle down. So, I mean, just a matter of fact, that's a very qualified, upskilled manpower for the example being provided. One direct example where the work is needed to pay off a debt. So it's quite, it's quite mentioned in many documents. So people being up skill qualified, they arrive, they come, they arrive, and they leave, having the same technical skills. So, so we have also uh, people having, I mean, the um, junior looking, coming with capitals and special techniques for the best people. So we have some, uh, I mean, blending with other people. So 
So with some uniformity, with some uniformity of skills in general. Did I answer all questions? Okay, that's three. That's true. It might be maybe some some communities. Uh, so, so because we know the toll systems, uh, so the the aid systems, uh, so uh, the two the weak ones uh, with hospitals and whatever, the being banks, social banks, uh, also in villages. And when we we give back these strategies, so we have some 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 loans with some lands to start up an activity. But need some strategical knowledge, so they just borrow silver to I mean the and the the brokerage of some some middlemen. That's the community collective point of this function. Thank you. And then we got the question about quality. We did several networks. Uh, see the point of salaries. You wanted to answer in my place. This dual question for trust about all and the connection between networks and the quest for profit. I'm, 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 I'm talking about trust interconnection, so which is added on to the in-kind payment we've already seen. It's almost difficult to follow this through on timely agreements like these ones of contracts for some people. We have the network on the notarial deed, payment in kind, which disappears right away. And so we can follow up the strategy as to the production and marketing activities. Yes, I've got just the example of Mathieu. And during the marriage, she got some advantages in kind. So the, the brother-in-law having some benefits from the wedding of, of, of the daughter. And also, we have a lot of interest in drapes trade. In the 15th century, anyone is interested in drapes uh, uh, trade. And he, 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 he got uh, uh, his daughter married. And after the marriage, we have some agreement. As, uh, so is going to receive some uh, some workshop, uh, and so we have this exchange, and they, and it commit himself to borrow some uh, some drapes, and I know we have some trust uh, network, but also some quest for profit, which is also needed, which is needed to take profit from these exchange in kind, which is a certain quantity of I mean. Uh, drapes for so he is father-in-law and then the second question the work which way is, is it going to be uh, paid so do we have some flexibility on the labor market and for salaries so this question opens opens up to some doubt we have some uh, agreements, uh, hiring agreements uh, in the style industry, but there are not so many to understand. One of the possible assumptions is that we need some internship, a lot of internship, a lot of apprenticeship as well. And also, this goes through, I mean, the lodging. So, so we have some description of these practices as well, in a, in a way. And finally, so, so we have the lodging, which is also available, but not versus the product. Uh, he has said this in the agreement. We have the, the, the lodging available so versus some manpower offered. So this is the product which is offered. And in the agreement, there is a clear, I mean, President, you're going to work because you're going to be a weaver, you're going to be a filler, and you're going to pay back for your lodging. So these are the skills that the individuals will look for. And this belongs to the labor market. Lodging is just integrated within the work agreement. So payment in kind. We have a sort of of, of game, of, of juridical interplay between uh, agreements, I mean, internships, salaries, and lodgings. So we have three important assets playing a major role in the general framework and where we can find also some payment in kind, manpower, i.e. And for transports, 
for transportation, that's a key issue. And many times I was asking this uh, uh, question about transport. So we also have to keep, not just to transport, we also have to keep. So for drapes, you know, we just work also for iron and drapes. We have the iron for the monetary currency. But that, that's um, that's a sort of of of, of trend. Also, we have to consider de rusting of metals so for transportation. That's key, as you said, because these manufacturing places, uh, as my colleagues already said, which is also explaining these these blacksmiths are just obliged to go through merchants. Uh, so for cereals, grains, and also meat, and also, I mean, technical uh, tools. The first answer, when I started working on the sources, I was very much struck because I got, uh, I got a D, a this person in, in, in mind, so the blacksmith. So, so I don't want to speak of this, this or the capability of this man, a blacksmith. But blacksmiths were not running, I mean, the, the workshop. They receive a salary, these blacksmiths. We were not running the shop. They are key, helped by some team, but having just a few responsibilities. Just a few responsibilities, but not running the workshop. So that's, that's, that's I mean, the, the carpet stone. So the, the carpet stone, because you speak of transportation, semi finished products outside. We have to see also procurements in minerals and whatever. So, and also coal, and also we have, we have all that. We have two blacksmiths, but also some, some uh, uh, other uh, people doing the worst bit of the work. That's, uh, that, that's that's the beating heart of, of, of blacksmithing activities. And then we have lots of enterprises. Uh, 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 I would like to speak of these, uh, these workshops. So uh, I just lost all my files, but uh, I will go back to my files. We have thousands and thousands of agreements. That's so ordinary. And if you want, uh, that's, very, that's very fortunate to have these agreements. Uh, they did not buy. They did not buy. Did not buy mules. Uh, so, so they used animals to work, and that's the uh, the, the 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 bit and heart of this work. These workshops mean small workshops. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and this also very well organized. The organization of districts, in a way, also gives an important place uh, to these activities. I don't want to go back to my slide from one part. Uh, and, and, and towards Roussillon. So you see the map, and also the specialty of these different uh, places. Knowing that there is uh, some competition, we know that in Abno it is full. Forging uh, did exist, and then later they disa it disappears because there is competition. Uh, What was most important uh, was uh, this country leading to the plain uh, area, these villages. Uh, and then we have the price. The price is high, but I didn't uh, find. Uh, I see there are some strategies, uh, there are people dealing with this kind of transportation, uh, having some power and they are running the enterprise, but I cannot go beyond. And then, uh, Metier, I worked on coastal navigation. Charbon, ni le produit semi-fini. Par contre, on retrouve après le fer en forme de lingot, en forme de bar. The coastal trade, iron as ingots, uh, and There is an expert in Aragon. I found comments that were still unknown to study coastal navigation. And the problem is that when I go outside the district from La Vallée, I, have, I find no more indications. So I can see transportation and the transportation model and the, the place of production. I mean, Perpignan. But after that, 
I only I have no more indication. Depends on the forge. So it's very difficult to to make an association between the districts and the norms of the coastal trade. So coastal trade. And I don't have any additional information. I have to work more on this point. I know that transportations have a major role for the in making the final products. Um, donc, sur le lot des voies, euh, j'ai pas de contrat de transport. Apparemment. Euh, for transportation, okay, we have no notarial deeds, so we don't need notaries. So I don't know the cost of freight or the price of transportation, so I cannot help my, my colleague to give you the detailed costs of transportation. This can be explained in many ways. Uh, there's something very local for Oder, Alsace, uh, uh, 20, 40 miles from Odell, from this region. So we didn't speak of the white drape being produced in this district. This is a sort of local wool, because this white drape is made of this local wool. I don't know the cost of transportation either, but for the short um, distance, and after marketing a finished product, so that's the same. So the, the uh, districts of Languedoc at at 40 miles from Lodell, more than one day uh, so, uh, travel so a uh, trip with some with some places being quite nearby for marketing products uh, and so the issue of transport uh, so raises after uh, after uh, March shows I couldn't follow up the 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 I mean the trip taken by drapes after fears the March shows, which is the language what Catherine Bernard said, not after trade of March shows, but when drapes come to Marseille, the Oden drapes are included in general denomination of Languedoc drapes, and lost. I got lost in tracing the trip of these drapes to Lodell because we're the general denomination, so I totally get lost and when they reach Italy or elsewhere, I don't know if they came from that place or another place, the geese or whatever, or coming from Languedoc, I don't know. So I, I got lost. So the issue of transportation inside the district, you know, inside the region, is difficult to, to be answered in a way. It's difficult to follow transportation up during the drape strip. And I go back to the conservation of goods, how to how to store goods by payment in in, in kind. That's a, a a way to bypass the issue of the storage of goods and drapes and salaries, because we have a date of of of, of a supply of these products. When we say payment in in kind or credit or so we have a date of supply, and the date of uh, supply uh, uh, corresponds to the days of the march. So when we say payment in 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 kind, uh, creditors can directly resell them, and then we have the problem of storage. Are we storing these drapes or not? In case the the, the creditors to resell these drapes after. Uh, Natasha Kukeri. Natasha Kukeri. Okay. Um, I know a little bit the bijoux and the. I would like to speak about the jewels. I know the field. I know this sector. I know this act, and, and I, know, I have a question, because uh, you said, I would like to go back to something we have mentioned already during the day, the intrinsic value. If I understood properly, the intrinsic value is right at the heart of this uh, 
much more than the artistic implication. So I would like you to go into that about the circulation of these commodities. The labor, the work of labor, and the so-called modeling of jewels is an important part of the object which will be contributing to the intrinsic value of the object. Another question, another question. Actually, it's not a question. Can you say, can you confirm that in the market examined with the Jews, can you confirm that this is a way to introduce uh, some flexibility into a market which was uh, uh, compelled. Okay. Or in the constrained market. Okay. Yep. So um, you mentioned the specific kind of knowledge and experience with this material of women that comes from the thing. And I wondered whether you see them, or you see that that knowledge and experience is creating a special space for women as brokers and within this trade, in the way that we see, for example, Be Beverly Mayer is shown within second-hand clothes trading, that women are able to utilize that knowledge and experience to create a position for themselves within that trade. Thank you. I have a question for Raquel Escuro. Okay, shall we go? Shall we go beyond uh, this uh, civil dimension and private consumption? So, can we see jewels as a form of payment uh, for international treaties? Uh, it was a suggestion by one of my colleagues in Ven from Venice, uh, Luciano Pezzolo, and he was speaking about the war debt. Uh, Ve Venice was sup supposed to pay for the Ottoman Empire. 300,000 ducats had been calculated, and he said uh, that Venice would never pay these uh, ducats, this uh, debt in ducats. Uh, they would give some jewels to the empire, some diamonds, etc. And uh, this is a very important uh, and very new field of research. So my question for Raquel is, do you have any information about that? I have. Uh, I'd like to add something. When uh, precious metals are being used uh, when they are, uh, and processed into jewels, the problem comes or arises uh, of, the, of the alloy or fine gold. And the fine gold. So they they can be defined like that, and this is becomes a crucial to express their value. Grazie a tutti. Allora, vado con ordine. Il ruolo della della lavorazione. Il microfono per cortesia. The role of uh, processing of the object and the intrinsic value, the source does not uh, say that. But there, I'd like to make a distinction between a silverware and golden uh, projects, uh, objects, sorry, but they are mostly silver. You can, we, they hardly gave a bowl or a vase in gold. It is mostly silver. I think that the value of the processing was considered as a very little one, and probably it was a hidden during, uh, in the agreement that was being made uh, during the exchange. It is something that I don't have uh, because the two parties are trying to find an agreement. I know how they 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 had a common assessment, but I don't know exactly which of the two started first, because I'm never told that, so it is very difficult to answer. But in the case of loose stones and pearls, I think it is easier because it's the market, and so it is easier. And in the case of jewels with stones 
and mounted uh, pearls, mounted stones and pearls. The artistic value, how can we consider the artistic value today? No, that in this period it is not uh, present. But going to the last question, uh, what is more important is the processing. OK, I give you an object uh, which has been processed. I can uh, uh, do an exchange as a processed object. And then I can disassemble it. And I give it to third parties uh, bit uh, in bits. And then the role in and the fine uh, uh, material. Lo fanno solo raramente. And the possession of the of the good uh, and hardly for silver, therefore pure metal. <laughs> Even in this case, uh, they sometimes describe the stones. Uh, so I have uh, the cut of the stone is always present. Uh, I have the weight. Uh, sometimes. Uh, Okay, rubinetto or diamond, a little diamond or ruby. The value is uh, is is a small pearls. I recognize them uh, by way by the weight of the of the pearls, uh, and I know that uh, all the pictures that you have seen, all these ladies adorned with pearls, uh, full of pearls. Uh, probably models were being covered uh, and adorned uh, with uh, uh, jewels. Uh, that were fake jewels uh, being sold in Burano with an impact on the uh, world market. Uh, but even in this case, uh, we are speaking, uh, the niche that I have presented, we're speaking of a sector where every one, they're all familiar with this assessment problem of weighing because they are bankers, the bankers, and it is a real money. Therefore, they usually have a session of evaluators and professional and skilled people, uh, both uh, strazzaroli and bankers, uh, to recognize and to do the assessment. They are called uh, the uh, ghetto strazzaroli, or second-hand dealers are called, because they have the expertise, uh, as uh, just like their Christian colleagues. Uh, this is all unsaid, unfortunately, because they are experts. And it is something they're not interested in. They are facing the notary. The deed has been made. It has, be, it has to be recorded. But I don't have the private uh, uh, deeds uh, or writings. As for the processing, I, I'd like to make a comparison. I studied the glass. I see the same thing. One of the problems when I studied glass, one of the problems is that we have this uh, Venetian high range uh, glass, uh, a very high price, but you don't find it in the homes of the Venetians. Uh, the uh, Venetians prefer having pelt bowls to drink and then the silverware, which can be used as a money. But when you have glass in Venice, uh, I see that in the inventories of uh, glass uh, factories, but it is not considered that much. It is as if it was, uh, as, as if everything was for the foreign market. Uh, as for the second question, butter, butter representing an agreement uh, uh, between equivalent among equivalent uh, uh, goods because uh, it is frequently not one to one but there is everything inside yes it is used to avoid the problem that there are specific constraints. It is one of the examples. Actually, the Jews, according to the law, the, 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 the Jews should have only used or uh, do business in cash. These had been provided for by the law especially in Venice, uh, and of course, they do completely different things because that was not a system to earn. They would have only earned uh, the established interest rate, which was very little and much lower than uh, the interest rate on uh, uh, real estate. And of course, this interest rate was much lower than any credit on income, on the yield. So all these systems, whatever I have described, is all done to avoid the problem in order for them to uh, avoid the law with a set of master contracts, every kind of master contracts. It's like a puzzle with the different bits coming together, and then when you put them all together, you can see the objective and you see 
you see that that is the objective. As for women, the question was whether women, since they have, they're more familiar with objects and experience, whether they, they can have a specific role. As I said before, in the case of estimate by uh, gas operators, uh, they are always males. Women lose their role as compared with the inland uh, 15th century. In the 15th century, we have uh, uh, women owning a banco, but this no longer happens in the ghetto. It is an, an in, indoor evolution uh, and a cultural development. Uh, of the, com of the Jewish community. And we always have evaluators. We always have men evaluating. Women are there at the Banco. They are play a role in the Strazzeria. For example, they are rearranging the clothing, uh, stitching, uh, tailoring, and then, OK, this is done by women. But actually, when the contract is made, it is a man doing that. And I wish to thank you for asking me this question, a very interesting suggestion, whether women are more capable or better at dealing or negotiating when they are the Christian, when they are the Christian players. Actually, I didn't think about that. I took for granted that they would be part of the market as males did. But I will keep it into consideration. Thank you very much for the suggestion. And whether they are better when they are the players, not when they are in the front line doing that. I will keep that into account. Thank you. As for the last question, jewels as an alternative payment outside the private market or as an alternative currency. There is one thing I didn't say. With the pearls, you have to pay taxes in Venice. You have to pay taxes. But in, I found uh, um, some examples. A tax payment, not uh, in money, but in pearls. Therefore, it means that uh, this, uh, this was recognized by the state. As for the question raised by Professor Chiriacono and Pizzolo's suggestions, I agree. They did, they did so, not just with the Ottomans and the role, as we said, the gift, gift and counter gift as an international policy as well. This is a case I hope I will be publishing soon. There, is, uh, uh, there are payments during Italian wars uh, with the crown of France, uh, payments made uh, in jewels. Actually, they did do that. Uh, and it is interesting for me. They go through the ghetto to have the jewels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will see you after lunch at uh, 3 o'clock. Thank you.